Okay. Um, well, welcome back for another GW coders. Um, so in our last coding meeting two weeks ago, I did some demonstrations of creating web apps um, using Google Apps Scripts, which is basically JavaScript that's connected to your Google products like um, Sheets or Docs or Slides or Groups and so forth. Um, I'll increase the size on this. At least I think I may have to do it. How do I? Oh, there we go. Um, so one useful resource, I just have it here at the top and I can, I'll put this into the discussion board too. Um, but they have really good documentation and um, it takes you by the different products and things that you can do with it here along the left-hand menu. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So like if you go into calendar, it's like how to create calendar events, how to add guests to calendars, all using app scripts to automate the tasks. Um, so for example, I use the calendar one to create the GW coders calendar. Um, so we keep a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet, and then it, when I update it, it updates the Google calendar to show when events are happening and who's presenting and stuff. And it's all automated through um, this Google Apps. So I go to this quite regularly. So like if you're using Sheets, it tells you all the different things you can do with a Google Sheet, um, which is a pretty long list compared to some of the others. Um, so for example, if you're doing uh, Google Tasks, if you use Google Tasks, they have a smaller number of things that you can do. Um, for adding tasks and scratching tasks off and so forth. So it's a really useful resource. Um, and I will go ahead and put it into the chat for you. Maybe. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, and so in the last one, I introduced kind of how to get started with using Google Apps Scripts. Um, and for that one, we created a web app where you would um, put in your name and it would tell you approximately how old you were. Um, but mostly I just wanted to show how the Google Apps Scripts works. Um, and again, as I said last time, the primary function is you have a file that's a .gs, which is for Google script, but it's really just a slightly shorter, um, slightly more limited JavaScript library that you're using. And you can rename that. Um, you're only allowed to have two different types of files in this system. So you can either do GS files or you can do HTML files and that's it. Um, so we used the HTML when we created the app script last time but what I didn't get into was really how you can start to integrate it with other Google products. Um, so I wanted to show that this week and talk some about some of the tips and tricks I've learned with doing this. So this is a Google sheet that I have. Um, I'll show it to you. So it's just a Google Sheet with some data about when things are submitted, different types of files. Um, and so I can access that Google Sheet from my app script um, because they're both owned by me. Um, if you don't own it, um, you have to get permissions from the file owner, um, which makes sense that you can't access other people's sheets. But as long as it's your own sheet, you can access it. Um, and for here, I'm accessing it by URL. So I created a var variable that I called sheet URL. Um, and then this is where the action actually happens is I have another variable that opens up the spreadsheet app and I open it by URL and then I put the URL in. Um, so that then tells me I now have a variable called spreadsheet, which is directly linked to the spreadsheet that I have, 
my Google Sheet. Then I can also grab tabs from within that then. So if you look back, I have two tabs, sheet one and sheet two. I'm going to want to use tab one. Um, so it's tab zero. They start like most coding with zero. So now I'm telling it to get the sheet, um, use the sheets function and get me sheet zero or the first one. You can also um, do it by name. So for example, if I name this sheet one, and I also, I copy this from a different, um, then I'll call it tab by name. So I can get a tab by the name of the tab too. So I can get sheet by name, and then I could tell it to get sheet one from the spreadsheet, which is the variable I named up here and call that a different variable so that I can work with just that tab. So you can get it by the number or you can get it by position. And then you can get values from the cells within that. Um, and so here I'm getting a cell from my sheet that I have up here. I'm gonna get the range. I'm just saying get one cell and I'm gonna get the value of that cell. Um, and then I'm then down here, I'm going to print it out. So I'll put it up here. And then for a second example, I can get values from multiple cells if I want. And I can do those. Um, I change it from get value to get values. And then I give it the range of cells that I want the values for. Um, so now if I run this function, I can select which function I want to run since I have multiple functions. And I run it. If all goes well, I got the first cell, cell A1, which should say date of submission. If we go, we can look. Yep, A1, date of submission. And I got cells B1 through B5. Go back, B1 through B5. Come back, and is that what I got? Yep, file name, the names of the files. Um, so now you can see how, now that I've told it which sheet I want to work with, I can start to manipulate that data. In this case, I'm setting, the, I mean, I'm getting the values out of it. Um, you can also set values from here. So you can pull or push information to and from the spreadsheet um, using code, which is really helpful sometimes. Um, so for example, I've used this when I want to um, have a set of values in a spreadsheet, and then I want to perform some manipulations of those and then have it update into a different column. Um, or I can put it into a whole different sheet, or I can move it to a different tab of the sheet. And you can automate all that task, um, which can be helpful. It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I also put in here, um, so with Google, this number here at the end of any document or sheet that you have is called its ID. And sometimes you want to use that. You can open things by ID. Um, and that's what I was doing here. So this is with, so this would be code for working with a Google form um, because you can, as I said, do this with docs, apps, I mean, docs, um, spreadsheets, Google Forms, any of the Google products primarily, they have this. Um, and so then you could access it by the ID number. So if you don't want to have the big URL, you can just access it by the ID. Um, you can also do it by active. So if you're just doing things while you have the sheet open, then you can set it to work on the active sheet. So that gets a little more confusing in my experience. So hopefully all that makes sense. It's pretty easy and straightforward, but it's a really nice way to start to be able to manipulate your Google Sheets um, or other Google products by code. Um, and that just gives you a lot of flexibility. So you can do some pretty interesting things. Um, also, I mentioned, maybe a long time ago. 
if you didn't know too, you can do like you can bring in JSON data into a Google Sheet, um, or you can like do basic web scraping into Google Sheets. Um, so another way I've used this is I've created a Google Sheet that scrapes a website once a day. Um, and then I have it manipulate the information that it pulls from that website and saves it in different places. Um, so you can do fairly easily stuff like that um, without necessarily having to get into Python or R and build a database to hold it and stuff. Because you have your Google Sheet already kind of as your backend database, you can quickly do things without having to set up and worry about the databases behind them. So another thing that I find useful that you can do um, is you can also save things into what they call the properties. Um, and you can pull things out of those properties. Um, so about a year or so ago, they updated their um, user interface for this. And for some reason, they did not bring being able to see the properties um, into the new one. So you have to use their classic editor to see what your properties are set as. Um, but basically, it's kind of a housing area where you can store data. Um, and I, what I've often used it for is storing things like passwords. Um, that way, if I'm going to share the script with other people, they won't be able to see my passwords that I'm using. Um, so I'll show what it is, and then I'll come back and show you the scripts for manipulating it. Um, That. So this is the classic editor. Um, so before they updated it or so, and then they have a button to use the new one. But in the old one, you would go to file, project properties, and you can have script properties. They also have one called user properties, but I've mostly just used the script. Um, and it's just a directory. So you have a key and a value. Um, so chicken says cluck password. This is my secret password. And these get stored and you can use them um, in this case, in any of this Google app script. Um, if you save it for user properties, then it's for anything that you are using, you can pull from it. It's always there for you. So down here, um, you can see where I can now manage that within my script as well. Um, so I can create a function to set property scripts and I tell it I'm going to um, get property scripts and I'm gonna use what they call property services to manipulate those. And then I'm gonna set my properties. So in this case, I had cow and duck and chicken um, but I can do too, just to show you that it actually does work. I'll add something to it, then I'll select the set properties and I'll run that function. Now, when I go back to my properties, you can see the twos that I just added. So I've changed the value for each of the keys that are set in this dictionary. Um, and then I can pull those and use those in other places. So again, I'm gonna um, set something, a variable I call script properties, but this time instead of setting my script properties, I'm gonna get a property from there. Um, and more specifically, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna get all the ones that I have. So I did a quick for loop. So I'm gonna go through each of my properties. I'm gonna get the key and the data out of there. And I'm gonna create a list of that. So now if I go get properties and I run the function, here, maybe I have to go to the new editor to see it. Let's do it over here, get properties. 
There I go. So now I can see all my keys and passwords um, and stuff that I had stayed, that I've saved in my properties. So again, this is helpful um, if you're gonna use passwords and stuff um, for like an API and you don't, you're gonna share this with other people and you don't want them to see it. You can just save things into this properties area and then pull it in whenever you want it. Um, yeah, just makes it easy to save things like that. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm kind of going pretty quickly through all this. Um, or if you have ideas of how this could be useful to you, um, I'd love to hear it. So then <clears throat> for someone else who's using that script, they would just be able to see the output, but they wouldn't be able to see, like if they tried to run get from properties, they would get an error because they wouldn't have access. Is that correct? Well, if it's saved as a script, as a property of the script, then they would have access to it. If it's saved as your user property, then they would not have access to it. So it kind of depends how you want to save it. If you want to save it attached to this script or if you want to save it attached to you as the user of that script. Um, yeah. Where I found it um, useful too is when you have something that um, is long and you don't want to have to type it out all the time, you can, again, since it's just a, key and value, you can get the property and just apply the value um, and create a variable for that. And then you just write like password in every time and you don't actually have to go and put the physical password in if you're gonna be um, running it. And I can show an example of that. Um, yeah, it's in a different browser, but I can bring up an example of that I think pretty easily too. But it's nice to have some place where you can store values and then reuse them over and over again. Oh. The next thing I wanted to illustrate that's um, a fairly common use too, uh, I think. So, and so there's a discussion forum on how to use Google App Scripts, um, and there's people who post questions. There are probably like six or seven questions a day that people are posting. And one of the people who manages the code for Google is always on, it seems. He's very active in it, or she's very active in it. And so they're always answering questions like, how do you do this? Um, but one that comes up often is, how do I email stuff from a Google app script so that they can create like automated tasks? Um, so you can automate a lot of different tasks with this. Um, one of the things that you can do, and I'll come back to the code in a second, but over here, they have a triggers tab and you can set triggers um, for when you want your app scripts to run. And it, so you can tell it like which function you want it to run if you have multiple functions in a file um whether it's in a deploy in the head and that's usually where it is but you can also select like it can be time driven or calendar driven it's like you can have it um when the calendar is updated it will run or if you want to do time driven you can do it like on a weekly timer every friday at 9 a.m. it's running. So it can be either driven by what happens um, or it can be driven by time. Um, so I've seen a lot of people say like, I'm developing an app script so that when the salespeople update um, the sales spreadsheet, then it automatically emails a copy of the receipt to the client that was there. Um, and they're doing using app scripts to 
be triggered by when something happens to then send an email of a PDF file that they're making that is auto made based on the data entered by the person. Um, so a lot of business applications like that are ways to automate things that people would otherwise have to do. And so emailing is often involved in that. Um, and it's real easy to send emails um, through here. Um, so you just create a function. And here I gave it a subject, a message, and I had some email addresses I put in. So then I just write um, a mail app, send email. This just says who it's coming from. And since it's coming from me in my Gmail account, um, it will just, if you put in a blank, it will just make it from you. You can change it to say, like if I wanted to change my name in it or something, but it always gets mailed through your Gmail account, which I'll talk about in a second, it has some implications. Um, because it's a Gmail account that I'm logged in as where I created it. And then it pulls the subject, the message. This little part will make it HTML, which allows you to include BCCs. Without the HTML, you can't do a BCC, I discovered. You can only CC people. So in this case, I'm just going to do a BCC to these two people. And it's going to send the message of tomorrow at 12 noon, and the subject line would be coders. Um, and when that runs, it would mail that out. I won't actually run it because I, those aren't real email addresses of people I know or anything. Um, but it really would send it. It's that simple. Um, so, but you can, for another task that I do with this that I wanted to automate, which it, Actually, I do it several places, but the reminder message that you got yesterday about GW coders, it uses this type of a script um, and it pulls the email addresses from everyone from a Google Sheet. They're kept in a Google Sheet. Um, and it just pulls that column of email addresses and puts it all in the BCC field and emails it out. And I have it set the trigger at 1 p.m. on Mondays, if there is a coders event the next day. So it does, it looks at the calendar, determines if there's a coders event. If there is, then at 1 p.m. it sends the message um, to everyone whose name is on the list. And that list is actually auto-generated with a different script where it goes to, um, it goes over to our Slack, and pulls the current list of users from Slack. And that's where then it auto generates the list that then provides the emails that then sends it out through the email system. Um, so it's again, a useful way to automate things and you can connect a bunch of different products together. So my Google Calendar is connected to my Google Sheet, which is connected to my Gmail to send emails which then I outwards connect to Slack with an API um, to make that whole process automated. Um, now, the one downfall, as I said, about it being associated with your Gmail account. Um, so with Gmail, if you just have like a general, you signed up on Google account, you're limited to sending, the biggest block of messages you can send, I think is 50 or has to be less than 50. And you can only send up to 200 a day. Um, now, most of us probably have never pushed our Gmail accounts to see, but it really will stop you at 200. Um, but now with your GW email, since it's hosted by Google, but it's not, a Gmail account, you have like the custom things. Um, you have unlimited sending, but you still can only send up to 50 in a message, I believe, um, or maybe not even. So if you're gonna do larger mailings, um, so we have about 400 people in Slack for GW coders. 
So it's too large to use my regular Gmail. So it actually runs through my GW email account. Um, so that way it has the unlimited ability to send messages to large groups. So if I really wanted to spam people through my GW account, I could. Though they have my real address, so they would be upset right back. Um, so yeah, it's really great for automating email messaging things if you're gonna create some type of message like that. It's gotten more complicated over time too. Like I can't say that the first time I played with it, I didn't make it that complicated to get Slack data and all of that. Those have been more like, oh, I wonder if I could do it. So then I start playing with it. And then a couple of days later, I finally figure out how to do it. So the next thing I was gonna talk about, I have two more things. So um, you can also add menu options to your, in this case, like a Google Sheet, um, but you could do it to a Google Doc or to whatever. Um, so in this case, um, I create a function to create a menu item. Um, so first I get the user interface, the UI for the spreadsheets. And then I create a new UI menu option. In this case, I created one called sync to calendar. Um, and then you create items within the menu. So it's a pull down menu. And I have one it's called update calendar and it runs a function that has to be in the same sheet as where this is. Um, so I'd have to have a function in here called function GW coders schedule. And then I add that to the user interface. So I will actually just show that, um, that would be easier. Let me go. GW coders schedule. So as you can see, it loads normal like, um, but then on the load, it just added this button, sync to calendar. And if I click on that, there is that update calendar button. And so this is actually the GW coders calendar. Um, it makes you realize, John, just how many coders events we've had now. Um, so here is today's session. And when I click on this button, sync to calendar, it will sync whatever is here um, to the GW coders calendar um, that you can subscribe to through Google. It's a Google calendar. And if you subscribe to it, then, um, Oh, I have to reauthorize it. So I'm not going to do it now. Just believe me that it works um, and it will update it. But what's interesting is I thought is you can add these menu items. So if you find that you're using something in an app script often and you want to be able to just run that part of the script, run that function from whatever Google product you're in, in this case, in script and sheets, you can add those menu items right into it. So you can create custom um, Google Sheets, basically. So if you're working in an organization and there are a number of functions that you've written that people have to use, you can add those menu options to their Google Sheets by giving them access to your script. Um, so I thought that was really interesting and could be useful. Um, just depends again on what you're doing and how you're using the different Google products, if adding a button would be useful or not. Then the last thing I was gonna share um, is just another way that I've been playing around with this, again, to automate tasks that I didn't want to do by hand. Um, so 
a couple, like a year and a half or so ago, we were asked to um, provide our CVs, our resumes to the Dean's office. And part of the request was they said they wanted our publications to have what's called a DOI, a digital object identifier with them. Um, so you see this often um, in articles. So for example, I was looking at an article earlier today. And as you see, like there's these links within the references that would link you out. I'll click on one, we'll see where it takes us. Uh, it takes us, I'm not gonna log in for it. Um, but they take you to typically where the file is housed. Um, I'll click on one more and see. Yeah, so here is the article that they were making reference to. And the DOI is the identifier that allows that to happen without having to write the whole URL for it. Um, but I didn't have them for my publications and there were lots of them. And so I decided I would create a script to do this for me rather than do it myself. Um, and so here I'll show. So these were my publications. I just copied and pasted all the references into this first column. Um, so I just did a copy and paste over, that was easy. And then what I wanted to do, so the sheet, and then I took the, as I said, you can get the tab by name. So I got the articles tab. Um, so then I went through each of those. So I created a for loop. Um, and then I went through to create the cell where it would go and just organize the data within there. And then what it would do is it would get the title out of um, the value. So it would go through and it would get each of the titles. Um, yeah. And then, so there's this cool website I found that's called crossreference.org. Um, and they have an API, which always makes it even better. Um, I don't know exactly what they do to make money, um, but basically they work with the metadata of research journals and articles. Um, and you can pull all types of metadata about different articles. And you can use their API and you can query things like the title of an article. So let's see, let's, um, now I guess I should get a title of an article. Can you explain how it's figuring out what the title is? I, yeah, I was like looking at the code, but. Couldn't quite understand how it was getting that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me look back at the code. Oh, yeah. This is slightly different. Um, this is actually, I had this other thing I was doing too, um, where I had a database of articles that I was also getting DOIs for. And there I had a column. See, I've broken it out by column. Okay. Um, so sense. I think what I actually did when I did my resume is I just had it send the whole, um, instead of just sending the title, I sent the whole thing to see if it could find the whole thing rather than just sending the title. Um, yeah, so there's a slight difference there, but you can send the whole reference and it will bring back the DOI or you can send the title um, and its accuracy gets better the more information you give it. Um, but as you can see here, it sends back a JSON file and it has everything that came back in their search. Um, 
so, but all I really wanted was the first one because that would usually be the best one. Um, and so I just pulled, let's see. Yeah, so I would have just pulled the first one out of these. So if we look back at the code, um, so it does the search with the title and it logs that and then it pulls, it uses a fetch in order to pull what it returned back. And then you can get the JSON and you can parse that then. So then I parse that JSON file that sends it back. And then I only take the first one, the highest priority one, the one most likely to be right. Um, which within the JSON file is kind of embedded. So you have to look into the JSON file to figure out where it is. Um, and then I made sure it wasn't blank. And then if it wasn't blank, I pulled it in um, and it just gives you the end of the identifier. So I added some HTML text to it. And I also put it into HTML so that it would create a reference, like a link to it instead of just the words, I wanted it to be a link that would be interactive because it was then go on a website. So that then created this. So it created the reference and then it added the https.org and then it put the DOI number in, which is this um, number that I have highlighted there. They all begin with 10 dot something or other. And then there's a series of other numbers. And since there were gonna be, um, so like when I did it for this articles database, there were, I don't know, 245 of them. And then for my own resume, I was doing 60 of them. So it was a lot faster to figure out how this code worked than to actually write it. Um, and to go through and look up each article and find the DOI and then create the HTML and all of that would have taken a long time. Um, so it's just then this, it's doing this for loop. It goes through all of them. It adds it. If there isn't one available, it says there's no DOI available. Um, and that's how it worked. Um, so it automated a task that otherwise would have taken me a lot longer to do. And I was able to do it fairly quickly. I, figuring out this took a little time, but not nearly as much time as looking up each article, um, copying and pasting the DOI over and then making the tags to make it HTML active and stuff like that. So that is another example of a place where I found that, again, it's an easy set of tools because it's already connected to your Google spreadsheet. So it, you don't have any database issues to worry about. You don't have to set up any databases. Um, it allows you to work easily with APIs. It allows you to do a whole variety of interesting things. Um, and since you can email things out, you can automate a lot of email tasks with it as well. So that's what all that I had to show really. Uh, um, but hopefully that was helpful to everyone. Does anyone have questions or anything? And I'm happy to share any of these scripts with anyone who wants them. Um, Many of them I have on GitHub already. So if you go to my GitHub, the Ryan R. Watkins GitHub, most of these scripts are already there in one form or another. Um, it's just a matter of seeing how I put them in different places on GitHub. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording then.